Welcome. Today I'll be talking about Japan, my two favorite subjects, wildlife, and one of my other favorite subjects, Japan. Thanks to Sigma Corporation for making it possible, and thanks to all the people from b &H for making this happen. Everybody having a good show? Good, good. I'm not just going to show pretty pictures. I'll also be talking about my, uh, the setups behind the pictures, what I was aiming for, and how I got my results. The first picture I should probably cover. I don't think I talk about this picture again, so I might as well cover it. Uh, if you look at what this was, this was a blizzard coming in, and it was a stark, you know, just a stark snow field, but I saw this tree with just a few leftover leaves, and I saw the two little cranes. What they do is that's, a, those are the rarest cranes in the world, the Japanese red crown crane, and they pair up for life. And so that's, that's a pair that's landed in the field. I like the little bit of dose of the color, but for me, one of the important things is, is composition, but also if you look closely, you'll see the slanted lines through the trunk of the tree. That's actually the snow blowing. And how I got that was I went down in my shutter speed, and it's funny that I'm with a tour group, six people, and I, I came up on this scene, I grabbed my zoom lens, whatever I had, and I ran out there like a crazy person. And I set up and I started yelling all these settings for everybody. And I started out at 500 just to make sure I got some sharp pictures. I wasn't sure, it was so windy, I wasn't sure what I could shoot down to. This was a 30th. I went down to a 30th of a second. And that gave me the guess combination of sharpness, but I actually got the, the snow movement, the movement of the snow. It wasn't so attractive to me just with the static snow. It looked more like noise. So I'm pretty happy with it. And I think because of the fact it was the beginning of a blizzard and it was pretty cold, out of the six people, I think two joined me outside. So only two other people got the picture. But it's one of my favorite pictures of that trip, that specific trip. I mentioned the cranes. This is some more, a couple more images of them. That little patch on the top is what they're famous for. That's actually wart. It's not feathers. It's like a wart-like wart little growth that the cranes have. And you can see the different poses there. Um, in the middle, they're calling. That's probably one of the, the most exciting things when you're shooting these types of birds are, is their mating behaviors. And on the right there, you'll see them all hunkered down in the nice snowstorm. This year was great. Um, as opposed to my recent trips to Alaska where we haven't had any snow, the Midwestern U.S. and the East Coast has gotten all the weather for the whole North America. They've been bypassing Alaska, which might be good for the Alaskans, but for photography, it's pretty boring. But Japan has been getting slammed this year. The last two years, they've been getting absolutely slammed. They broke some records this year. They got like seven feet in two days or something like that. Just They broke all the records for this year. And we were there for 23 days and we got two blizzards, very lucky. But we, what I mean by that is we timed them so we didn't get stuck anywhere. We were actually at, able to go out and photograph during the blizzard. We weren't stuck on a road somewhere. So I made the decisions to travel by luck, perfectly timed it so we didn't get stuck. And I mentioned that the, breed, the mating behavior and the breeding behavior is the most interesting thing. Here, here this guy's landed in a snowstorm again. And what he's doing is he's actually, it's a threat display. So he's showing his red patch on top. And he's putting his wings up as a threat display. And then he'll, he'll proceed to walk around in circles and do this beautiful, interesting dance. Really interesting. And then that will infect the other birds. The other birds will start to take that. And they'll want to start, the young ones will start practicing, but the other birds will take that. And they'll show their bond and they'll start dancing. And pretty soon, I may have some pictures in here of a couple groups, but maybe you might even get 50 birds at once dancing in the snow. It's really interesting. And for me, it seems like they really just enjoy the snow. When it starts to snow, I mean, the same for me. I grew up in California. We don't get real snow. We get ice that, that falls from the sky. We don't really get snow. But in Japan, you get the real... They, I've read they have some of the best snow in the world in some of the northern areas. Best snow as in the largest flakes, the driest, softest snow. Um, but the birds really seem to enjoy it. When it starts to snow, they just go bonkers. They go crazy. They just jump all over, spin. Really interesting. Very interesting. And in a case like this, um, I'm trying to watch the background. I actually like when you get the, the habitat in the background. It's not just a, a blue sky or just a white, white background. I like the, the trees. It shows you the habitat, but also it highlights the snow falling. So you get to see the snow in front. It makes a little more contrast. And most of these pictures, I think most of these pictures were made in the last two years. I've been going to Japan now for, I think, eight years, something like that. I do a tour 
one or two tours a year out there. I just, I love it. It's like addicting. Once you go, you want to keep on going back. And this is just another case of one of the birds. I mean, it seems to me like they're jumping for joy. I'm not sure actually what's going on because it's a single bird. But they really do seem to like the weather, especially when it's, like I said, it gets nice and cold and snowing. Uh, the reason we go in winter, a couple different reasons. Number one is, in this specific case, actually in all the cases with the wildlife in Japan in the wintertime, is they congregate. So they form big groups for safety and for feeding, and they get together in big groups. They don't, they don't uh, disperse. Already this month now, they're already dispersing. And by next month, they'll be all different parts of Japan and Asia. They spread out all over. Each pair, I forget what the exact figure is, but it needs miles of square territory, you know, pristine, nice, natural, clean areas. And that's one of the reasons they're still the rarest crane. They were hunted to extinction. They've been protected for, I think, 50 years now. I think the worldwide population, I think, is in the 3000s. In Japan, they have a population that just stays in Japan. I forget now. I think it's like 900 birds. It's really, really low. So it's the rarest bird in the world. Our whooper is a little bit more rare, but that's now, it's not really a viable species anymore. It's been raised by man. So this is the last, the rarest of the species that's still wild. It's really interesting. Um, so that's one of the, that's one of the advantages, like I said, of going to winter is they congregate in large groups to feed. Otherwise, they're gone all over Russia, Asia, China, everywhere. The birds get fixated. It's great for photographers. They get fixated on certain things like a snowball sometimes. Here, I think it's the bird's own feather. The bird literally, I don't know, oh, I only have one picture of it. The bird literally danced with its own feather for like half an hour straight, just jumping up and spinning and flying around, just totally fixated and amazed by its own feather. It's great for photographers. Sometimes I'll just pick up uh, a snowball and play with a snowball for whatever amount of time. And uh, I think last trip or year before, I don't think I have any pictures in this slideshow, but one of them picked up like a maple leaf, a golden maple leaf, and was just dancing and dancing and dancing. The other bird took it, started dancing. The other bird took it back, started dancing. It's pretty amazing. And I don't know how many wildlife photographers are actually in the audience, but for me, it doesn't get, doesn't get much better than that. And this is a threat display. So the birds are just chasing chasing around, chasing each other around. Kind of interesting. If you, can, if, you see the, um, if you see the angle of view, one of the ways, one of the things I like to do is get really, really low down. So you get, you get less depth of field, so the, you'll get more extraction from the background. The birds will pop out more out of the background. And also, if you notice, I'm trying to keep the birds out of the center. So I'm trying to do a more of a dynamic composition. And how I'm doing that is I'm using dynamic focus, so I'm not relying on the center point. I'm actually allowing the camera to take over, and I can frame anyone, everywhere I want in the viewfinder, and the camera should follow the subject around. It's one of the advantages. Single point works fine. I tend to prefer more of the, like I said, the dynamic type of focus points. One of the things I use, some of the other methods I use, is I use a rear button focus. So it's separated. I separate the release from the focus. And that really helps with sequential photography or shooting groups, uh, bursts of pictures. It really helps, especially, amazingly enough, with birds like cranes. And one of the reasons is because if you're using front button, every time you take a burst or a picture or a group of pictures and you go back down, you lift up and you go back down, you're reacquiring focus. The camera stops focusing, starts focusing, stops focusing, starts focusing. If I'm using a rear button focus, I can hold and I could take groups, singles, multiple frames as I want, the camera never leaves the bird's head or wherever it's locked on, hopefully the head, right? So you have a lot less missed focus. You have more consistent frames over series. If you go to rear button focus, I recommend you probably try it, but stick with it. Don't try in the middle of a big trip to Antarctica or, or to Japan. Try it at home first, put some time in. But I have to say, I would never go back. So I've had to help people in like the tour. They want me to check out their camera, try and help them. And they have front bokeh activated. And we'll be focusing on a crane in grass. And I'm trying to lock on the crane. I'm doing you know, a few pictures, little group, little group shots. I mean, burst shots, I should say. Burst shots of the, of the crane. And half the time it's locking under the grass. The other half the time it's locking under the bird. So I don't see how I would ever go back to front button focus. So it's something you can try on your own. It works great for portraits, works great for landscapes. Works great for wildlife. And that's kind of a, one of my favorites, actually. So these two birds are 
It's a big threat display, and they're jumping up into the air. What they usually do, they usually kick. They'll kick and peck each other like a fight. Nothing ever happens. I've never seen anyone really hurt. It's mostly, it's mostly for show. It's not like when you get two brown bears fighting or anything like that. Something a lot different. It's mostly all show. Here's another case of them just doing a display. That one on the right is about to kick something. And I normally don't shoot that tight. One of the, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been going to Japan now for eight years. One of the biggest changes for me has been going to rely less and less on prime lenses, like a 500 f4, 600 f4, 300-2.8. What I've done now is I went, <clears throat> this year was the first year that I actually went all to zooms, and I could not be happier. I took a 24-105, a 120-300-2.8, which is my go-to lens for low light and action, and I took a new lens, a 150-600, and that's one of the newest lenses Sigma has, and it was amazing. I'll show you some pictures coming up later that give you an idea. But one of the things I, don't, I really like about the, the zoom lens is not just the way in the close focus, is the flexibility, being able to frame as you want. In some of the places we go to in Japan, um, you're actually kept back at a certain distance. It's not open. The birds are, are wild. They can roam wherever they want, but they don't want people going past a certain point. In that case, a, a prime lens is a big disadvantage because as the birds move closer, you need to start changing lenses. And on past trips, I would do half prime and half zoom. And I remember many times I would, I would get an image, like the two birds jumping up in the air, that image, for example. I would get a certain image. I'd look around my group, and they have a 302.8, 800 laying in the snow. All their prime lenses laying in the snow, and they happen to have a 7200 when that action happened when the two birds jumped up in the air. They had a 7200, so they have this little tiny little dot in the middle of the frame. So, you know, the sharpest... Best lens in the world is completely useless if you don't have it, you know, if that's not to your eye when the action happens, right? So being able to have a high ratio zoom lens means you've got something on the bird or the subject at all times. So it's a lot more powerful, I think. So I found that last couple years at least. Here's another example for jumping up. I, these birds are really large. Um, man, I don't remember the extra specifics versus, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with like Sandhill maybe, Sandhill Crane. These birds are a lot larger than a sand hill, much, much, much bigger. But I like how they have so much contrast. It, it, they happen to be a really good target for autofocus, so it's pretty, pretty easy, actually. This, pi this picture uh, is at the Sigma booth. They actually blew it up on their, on their main display. Interesting. Has anybody shot, been to Japan and shot pictures in Japan? Anybody ever? Oh, okay, a couple. This is the first time I've ever actually ever seen one of the cranes with orange feet. The pads in their feet are orange. I've never seen that. I think it's a one-off. Some, some genetic thing, mutation. And for me, when I go to Japan, like I mentioned before, we, we, I always strive. Wintertime for me means snow, not in California, but everywhere else. It means snow. So when I go to Japan, you always, one of the reasons is, you know, it's a big softbox. When you're dealing with high contrast subjects, it's a lot easier to be able to photograph all day in the snow. You don't have to worry about your light angle so much. As soon as the sun comes out and the clouds disperse, you've got major problems with light-colored animals. Actually, all the animals in Japan, they're all high contrast, so you're going to have problems. So number one, but just number two, falling snow to me means winter. So it tells more of a story that we're there in wintertime. You know, if it's just clear, it's not such a, it doesn't mean as much to me without it. I mentioned we had a couple blizzards this year. This is interesting. So this picture was taken in a complete whiteout. It was actually snowing upwards because the wind was so strong, it's blowing sideways. The, the snow was going up, actually. It was so windy. And when it really started to blow, so when it started, when the wind started cranking, it sounds almost like a train coming, just, you know, the loud noise. The birds all got together really tight. And then when, the, when it really started to blow, they all stuck their heads up. It was like a threat. They, they all wanted to warn each other what was happening. I'm not sure for whatever reason, but... It was really interesting. You can see here how they're all like in a, it's called alert posture. They're all looking for a threat. But it was just the snow. It was snowing so hard. There's another shot of the same thing. Now, in here also, I'm, I'm using um, a slow shutter speed, I think. This was about a 60th also. Thankfully, I didn't have to go down to a 20th or a 30th lower because it was snowing so hard and fast. The wind was so strong, it didn't take much to blur it. But I think in a case like this, you're much better off doing a slow shutter speed and it shows the wind, it shows the action versus just like steady, just frozen snow, you know, in the frame. The, the snow looks more like noise in that case. Here's a single. 
And this is what I was talking about earlier, that the birds really just seem to love the snow. So after the blizzard stopped, it was just heavy snow, not much of a blizzard anymore. And the birds were going completely just crazy, jumping all around. It was amazing. And um, I had the question actually today, and someone was saying, how would a 500 F4 compare to like a 150 to 600 or a 50 to 500, some type of zoom, super telephoto zoom? And we were talking about it. And actually, I use this picture as an example, saying that in low, low, low light, because that the prime is a fixed F4 aperture, of course, you're going to have a little bit quicker acquisition, a little bit better tracking in low light. But it doesn't mean to say that the zooms have not don't have as good autofocus because this is in a in a dark, you know, heavy snowstorm. A white bird with black highlight, uh, black details against gray sky. <laughs> And I was able to lock on no problem. And I was able to track. I have probably 100 pictures like this. The bird just different poses up in the snow. It was locking on very, very, very well. But in this kind of case, um, you need to have your autofocus technique down. It's not very easy. Even just to acquire the bird in the snow is a little bit difficult. And then when they start doing this in these different kind of behaviors, it's, it's not too easy. And in this case, though, having dynamic focus on my Canon it's called, expand, it's called AFPF, I think it's expand all. So I have all the points available and I have it where it shows the active point. So I'll lock on with the center on my Canon and it shows the point, it goes all over the frame to show the point where it's, it follows the bird all around. One of the easy ways to explain that, so it's dynamic with Nikon, also is, is autofocus tracks the subject what? Front to back, right, on one axis. But when you go to dynamic or the mode I talked about with Canon, it does another axis which is side to side all around the frame. So up, down, laterally, an angle, diagonally, whatever. It does a separate axis. So not just front to back, it's where? All over the frame. So for me, on an image like this, I'm able to go in a little bit tighter with a zoom. And what I do is I just try and keep the bird's parts in the frame without cutting anything off, okay? But it lets me relax. I don't think I could work with just a center, with just a steady lock center point. I can't keep everything centered. And I think what would happen is I'd be losing body parts off the sides and off the top. I tend to work a little bit tight. This is probably uncropped. Another same thing again, just to show you, you know, just to show you conditions can get kind of tough, but if you have, you know, good technique, like I mentioned, rear point, some other things you can do that really help. Hopefully everybody DSLR, not even just DSLR, but most of the higher level DSLRs or the mirrorless cameras, They'll have a uh, tracking sensitivity. It's one of the, your menu options for autofocus. And what I do is I recommend everybody try, it's very important to go to slow or long on Nikon, slow on Canon, long on Nikon. And that just tells the camera to stay locked on the subject longer before it goes to an alternative subject in the frame. So I find it holds. I tell people, one of the common things I do to tell people is, when you're doing a tour, reading on internet, or going to a talk like this, and you're looking at different people's work, you know, look at what they're telling you, and it doesn't mean to say that's the perfect method for you. What you need to do is understand what they're telling you, maybe give it a try and see if you can work it into your, adopt it into your technique. But don't just do something because someone else does it, or just don't adopt my techniques because I'm telling you to. What I tell people to do, like on the track and sensitivity is, get two Coke cans or whatever you're drinking beer or whatever and put them on a table and then push one of them back, maybe two feet or three feet, and then go to the track and sensitivity, men sensitivity menu and then lock onto the first can or the bottle and then go to the second one, right? On normal or fast, it's almost instantaneous. It goes to, this, to the, back, the back subject. But when you go to long, you can actually count. So you can go to the second subject and count one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. It stays on the first subject you can go right back. So what that means is when this bird's jumping up in the air, if a little, if a, if a crow or a gull, something cuts in front, or there's a pole, or there's a tree in the background, it won't tend to go to the background. You won't drop focus. With it on long or slow, it'll stay on the subject longer. So how I do my photography, it works very, very, very well. And this is one of the most interesting shots you can get is when you get them, um, the two, the pair. I said they, they pair up for life, right? So when you get them doing a mating dance, you can get them either mirrored or away from each other. 
one of the most in interesting shots you can get. And if you could see up on there, I'm not sure how clear it is, but the, fo the tracking, the dynamic focus, depends on which camera I use, I don't remember exactly, but the, the all points, autofocus method worked perfectly. It's locked right on their heads. You can see the back of their the little red spot, and you can see their eye perfect in focus. One of the problems is with that sensitivity, especially if you go to fast, you're going to be locking on snowflakes. One of the ways you can help develop a technique where it doesn't lock on snowflakes so much is by using rear button focus. Tracking sensitivity on slower or long, but also one thing you have to get used to is being able to subconsciously just being able to do it by habit is letting off the focus and reacquiring. So if, you, if, it, if the head or the face, the eye doesn't look 100% sharp, you can just quickly let off and go back, or front, depending on how you're doing it, just let off and go back down quickly, that'll reacquire. You have to get used to doing that. Because just because the camera's locked on doesn't mean it's locked on the wrong spot. It could be on their foot, the back of their wing, you don't really know. So it's good a lot of times to just let off quickly and go back down and make sure it's locked on their head. And then let the dyna dynamic or that uh, AFPF all points take over and track it through the frame. One of the beauties of having a zoom lens is you can go in close like something like this. I've learned this over the years. One of the, one of the advantages of using a telephoto zoom over a prime lens is close focus. That's a huge thing. My 600 f4, my 500 f4, I think the minimum focus is like 13 feet, something like that, which isn't very close up in the frame. Most of the telephoto zooms I use, the 50 to 500, especially that close focus is like four feet. So I'm able to actually just, I can even shoot a flower with a bee or a butterfly and a flower even, it focuses that close. My 500, 600 f4, you don't have so much flexibility. What I like to do if you do have a five prime, a 500, 600, whatever, is you can put an extension tube on the back of a teleconverter and stick it in a pouch or your vest, whatever you use. And that extension tube on there gives you just a little bit more close focus distance so you can get a little closer like this one. This is just with a, like a 150 to 600. And that's just preening. I like that one. It's almost like the, it's, it's floating in space in the, in the snow. And on an image like this, I'm probably about plus two. So I'm shooting for the highlights. What happens, everybody know what exposure compensation is, I hope? We don't have time to go into it now, but hopefully you do. If you don't, look it up, find out what it is, start using it. I'm in manual mode, I'm probably plus two off the meter. So I'm taking the meter reading, what it recommends, and I'm going plus two stops over what the meter's recommending. The reason is I'm exposing to the right, so I'm putting the bird's head, the highlights in the head, I'm putting it to the right side of the histogram, all the way in the last box. If you shoot a, can a camera, especially a Canon, if you're shooting Nikon or Canon, especially Canon, and you're shooting in snow on zero, you're shooting pictures that are gonna be dark gray. So what happens when you get back to the hotel that night and you're gonna start processing, you're gonna to have to grab your exposure slider and slide it all the way to the right, right? A couple stops, a stop at least. What you're doing is you're just creating a bunch of noise. So you're losing sharpness, introducing noise. So I recommend exposing right in the frame by using exposure compensation or manual, whatever you're using. So it's interesting to show you an example. You know, like I said, I've transitioned over professionally from mostly all primes to about half and half in this last year, like I said. Two trips now I've went, I've did Alaska and I've did Japan now with just zoom lenses. And you might say, well, I'm a prime guy. I don't, I don't believe in zoom lenses. Well, you probably need to wake up and look at what's out there because the new, prime, the new zoom lenses are giving you prime quality, solid. Solid professional quality. That's 100% magnification. You're dealing with a 1080p file, so it's not as sharp as it could be, but on the computer, it's like razor sharp. Really sharp. We'll go into that again. One of the advantages, one of the things I like about the Japanese wildlife is it's not like American wildlife. Let's say cranes, for example, here. Um, the sandhills here, everywhere in the US, including Alaska, they're hunted like crazy. So if you get one close up flying at you, they'll usually go around you rather than fly over you. They'll just do a square turn and go right around you and keep on going. The birds in Alaska, uh, the birds in Japan, sorry, <laughs> Alaska. The birds in Japan haven't been hunted for 50 years or whatever. So they've lost their fear of humans. So when you get them to fly at you, this is with like a 35 millimeter on a zoom lens, they'll fly right over you. You can hear, their, you can hear the wind rushing off their, the wing beats. Sometimes you can actually feel the downdraft. They fly just a foot over, two feet over your head. You get a big crane flying right over your head. So what I've been doing last five years or so is I'll stand with a 24105 right 
when they're taking off in the evening to leave and just shoot it right over your head with a 24 or 35 around there, that focal length like this one, and you get them going right over your head. Interesting. I mean, I can't, I've never found that in the U.S., anywhere to that in the U.S., except maybe if you go to a rookery, you're better off. If you go to like alligator farm in Florida, you can get them flying over your head, but, but that's not a crane. Oh, this is an example. I think this is 24 millimeter maybe. Interesting. I don't mind the bands. People are against bands. I don't mind the bands too much. It's interesting that one of the attractions at one of the crane parks over there, if, you, if you're going to go, you can email me. I'll tell you where this happens. Or if you want to go on a trip, I can send you information on my trips. I have business cards up here. My wife has them in the corner and the light over here. She can give you a business card. I do a trip here every year. I'm doing two trips next year. They feed the birds uh, fish. In the afternoon at 3 o'clock, they go out and they feed fish. And what that does is, their idea is, it increases their hormonal, you know, their hormone balance because they introduce a little bit of protein in their diet. So that spurs them to go off. It's springtime. They give them a cue to go off and start to leave the areas in winter, wintertime areas, and go off into the spring. So they only, they cut it, they start it and they cut it off. But the in interesting thing is, the kites and the eagles and the hawks have learned it's their free handouts of fresh fish every day, live fish. So you get some interactions with them. It's interesting to shoot. Very interesting. You get eagles, you get white-tailed eagle, you get stellars, you get black-eared kites. Different birds come down to fight the cranes for the food. I like this picture. It's interesting. He's going in for the kill. And then one of the people on my last tour saw this picture and they said, oh, that's kind of cool, but how, how are you going to explain to people what a, what a, a baby trout's doing in the middle of an open snow field in Japan? It's kind of interesting. But Well, I'm telling you, the, the person fed him, fed the, fed the bird. And, you, you know, there's the, of course, there's snow monkeys. That's a big draw you know, to go to Japan. And when I've, I've, like I said, I've been going to Japan eight years now, I think, something like that. And the first few times, I didn't really have a desire to go to, to do the snow monkeys. I ended up going because everybody, all people on the tour want to go. And I've been now five times maybe. I like it a lot. It's actually pretty fun. I try not to do the same old shots everybody else does, so I don't, I don't do much when they're actually in the water here in the pools. But you can't not resist. You can't resist it. You have to take some pictures. They're just so cute. Especially the babies. This year, man, I want to say they had 80, 80 babies born in this one. We go to one place everybody else goes to. It's a hot springs park. So the, the, the I almost said eagles. The, the monkeys come down for the hot springs to stay warm. And also the park feeds them to keep them, low, to keep them close, to help them make it through the winter. And this year was really good to them. So they had, I think, 78 young so there are 78 babies running around, baby monkeys. Cute, cute, cute. Very cute. As soon as you put your camera bag down, usually a, a monkey will jump on it, and they used to play. <laughs> and this year was the first time I was able to bring the Sigma's new lens, a 150 to 600. And it's funny that you have to be careful when you're listening to presentations and you're going online reading or you're watching a video, or you're going on a tour even, I always warn people to, first of all, look at the person's images that you're listening to. And then second of all, look at what their motivation is. Third, look at what they're actually shooting with. I know lots of colleagues in the industry that are professional photographers, and they do blogs, they do, you know, on social marketing, all these different ways they go on and communicate with people. And they'll tell people flat out, you have to buy this lens. It's, it's the must-have lens for a nature wildlife photographer. Let's say a 300 2.8, I guess, whatever lens is. And I know personally, they don't even shoot with that lens. So why are they recommending it to everybody? Well, to make money. So they want you to click through their links. They want you to go to their site so they can generate more ev revenue through ads. I'm not required to talk about any of this stuff with Sigma. So I'm sponsored by Sigma. I'm here for them. But all they want me to do is just share my images and share my techniques with you and try and get you motivated to go out and shoot. Hopefully, you'll learn a few new things. But I don't have to tell you how great their lenses are. I don't have to tell you how sharp they are. I'm just sharing this with you to try and help you. Because I've learned a lot. I've been super happy with their newer stuff especially. To give you an example, like I said, people are sort of snobbish on lenses, and they should be. Zoom lenses haven't always been professional quality. Um, but last couple years, unbelievable image quality. So this is handheld, 600 millimeter, a baby snow monkey with a little piece of green he's munching on it for a snack. And this is made handheld 600 millimeter. I think I was a thousandth of a second, a oh, five hundredth of a second, I'm sorry. And then this is 100% pixels. It's absolutely amazing. You can see every single little whisker and hair. 
It's prime, like prime lens quality, completely. So there's no worries anymore when you talk about things like that. The photo on the right is actually my wife's. I'm proud of her for that one. Unfortunately, she didn't let me know. I hear her shutter going off. What are you shooting? Oh, man, a monkey sitting there on the lawn, up on a rock, really nice. They're just so cute, so fun to go shoot. I've been shooting there five years. I still love it. I still shoot. And you can see his little sister there on the right. Most of the groups of monkeys, they're mostly all female, sisters, daughters. The males are usually off on their own in troops of young monkeys. So that's probably a sister, I think, on the right there. Just so cute, really cute. They're always doing some type of interaction. Um, that's another reason I like using the zoom lenses because you can shoot an image like this real close, real tight. You can zoom out, shoot the whole you know, portrait of the whole body. Then you can zoom in up on the hillside. Really, really a lot of advantages going with the zoom lenses for this type of work, really. And not to mention that it's a hike. You actually have to hike, I think it's a mile on a flat road to get there. They don't let you in, you have to walk in. And I wouldn't want to be bringing six prime lenses. I was real happy bringing three zoom lenses. I don't know if I'd want to hike with six prime lenses. And this is right after they had a bath. It looks like they had blow dryer, huh? Real fluffy. They're just enjoying the little bit, of, little bit of light. I love the blue eyelids on the left. So if you ever go, try and shoot that with the, some, of the, some of them with the eyes closed. They have a bright blue eyelid. I don't know if you can see it blew up on there, but they have a bright blue eyelid. Very interesting. And they don't want you looking into the eyes of the monkeys. If you ever go, they get some kind of freaked out. They get a little bit aggressive, so just look away. And also, don't bring any kind of food or drink near them. So my wife had a, a Japanese, it's, uh, I forgot the brand name. It's delicious. It's a tea. It's not too sweet. It's a really unsweetened tea. And she had a bottle stuck on the side of her backpack. As soon as they saw the label, they ran over there. And one went up and grabbed it and started trying to bite through the bottle just to get inside it because they know humans have food. Free snacks, so don't bring food into the park if you can remember. And that's 100% pixel of that. So that's, that's made to fit the screen. That's 100% view. So that's actual pixels. Hopefully it looks as sharp as it does on the computer. And if you want to see how sharp that is, load one of your pictures tonight on the computer and go into 100% pixels and see how, how sharp your lens is comparing. It's, it's sharp, very, very sharp. They spend most of their day grooming. It's really interesting. I mean, they groom and groom and groom. Interesting for photographers. I try and get them off to try and get them where it's more natural, not just in the snow. I try and get them doing different things. Here's more nit nitpicking. And I just zoom in and do a close-up. Rather than move my body, I can just use a zoom and zoom in real close. I just love the fingers and the head like that. One of the big advantages is they have certain birds you don't get anywhere else, or at least not realistically you're going to get anywhere else. This is the stellar sea eagle. Anybody familiar with this bird here? Anybody know the bird? Oh, okay, one person. It's the, on average, it's the largest eagle, the heaviest eagle on earth on average. The, the Philippine sea eagle has a little bit bigger wingspan, but this bird on average is the biggest bird in the world. Next to the bald eagle, not even close. This bird's much larger than a bald eagle. And it's funny for birders, or if you've never seen these birds in real life, I remember my first time I get to Japan, you just see them up on a, on a light pole or on a telephone pole, just the, the silhouette. You can tell it's not a bald eagle. They're just so much more massive. One of the reasons is this bird is a specialized marine, it's a fish eagle, so it's specialized, the bill is specialized to go through salmon flesh. So it's a real heavy duty bill. Our eagle, the eagle that we have here, the American bald eagle and the golden eagle, they're just general, general cleanup. They just eat whatever roadkill, whatever they find to eat, trash dump, McDonald's, wherever they can find. But these birds are specifically engineered just to rip open the fish, the salmon. They have a big, heavy bill. Last few years, they've actually switched over. They're doing more deer now. They're eating more dead deer, but because there's a lot less. We, we do some, I do uh, at least three days here to do just the eagles. And what they are is they're way up in the top of Hokkaido. They come over from Asia and they stay the winter in Hokkaido. Uh, Hokkaido. They spread around Hokkaido. Sometimes they actually will even migrate to Honshu, the main island, but most of the time they're in Hokkaido. And what they do is they go up on the ice flows. So we, taste, we pay someone to go out and they actually throw fish to get them up on the ice flows and they just sit out on the ice flows. And sometimes you can get close enough to get portraits. Really nice. You can also do the same thing in town. That's the whole bird, what it looks like. Really interesting. And like I mentioned before, this is a redirect, so he's making like a 90 degree turn. 
um, what did I say, rear button, dynamic. One of the other autofocus tips I can give you also is when you're looking at your settings is to go with release priority. Don't put up with focus priority, which is one of the basic defaults on a lot of cameras. And what that means is the sh even if you hold the shutter down, it won't take a picture unless the autofocus gives it the okay that it's sharp. But the problem is, it doesn't necessarily mean the subject in focus or not. It's whether the computer thinks it's not is or not. So I've had cases where the subject's razor sharp right in front of me and the camera won't let the shutter fire because for whatever reason, the autofocus is locked or it can't lock on or whatever, it won't let the shutter fire. And I've seen lots of problems over the years doing tours where the people on the tour are just having lots and lots of problems where they just can't get consistent frame sharp. And the reason is because the, the, you know, they're, they're trying to take the photo release the shutter and the, half the time the camera's overriding them and not letting them release the shutter. So what I recommend is getting away from that whole, that whole business and just going to release priority. It's a setting in the camera so that when I press the shutter down, it's going to fire. It won't have to check with the autofocus system. There are certain situations you'll need that focus priority, uh, sorry, focus release priority, but not in this case. And most, for this type of thing, you don't. It actually is a hindrance. Um, also, one of the most important things for any type of photography like this is using the proper shutter speed. So for this type of bird, the default you want to start out is, is about 1250 of a second and then go up from there. Even the cranes, uh, the only bird I would probably change, like let's say you're in Japan for example, would be some of the smaller birds. Like if you're going to shoot a kite, you might, might want to go 2000 or 1600 as a default, as a start off shutter speed. You can go even higher. 2,000, 3,000 is even better. But start off at 1250 for best results. I think that one's 1,600 of a second. Still landing on a piece of ice. <clears throat> and in this kind of thing, I would tend to go um, either with dynamic. If you're using center point, <clears throat> and that's, that's the mode you're using and that's the way it's going to be, what I'd recommend is trying to get away from using center point so much. So in this case, you could actually knock the center point off to the left more and set it up two or three left of center, what that'll give you, that'll give you more room coming in. So you can use the center point off center to give the bird more room in front when you're panning across. That can help. Sun behind. In this case, I'm metering using manual metering and I'm metered, I'm metered right to the side of the sun, right to the left or the right, one, right to one side. And how I normally do it is, I'm in manual mode, and I'm using auto ISO if I need auto. Most of the time I'm just in manual mode. And what I'll do is I'll meter one, either one side of the sun or the other. And I'll set my, I set my shutter speed first, 1250 or 1600. And I'll set my aperture probably around F8 or so. And then I'll raise my ISO up to give me my exposure. You don't usually want to include the sun in a picture like this because what it'll do, it'll tend to under, underexpose. The sun has too much influence. So I tend to meter right off the sun. One way to help. This is a good example of why it would be good to take, go off center point or use dynamic also. So this year I actually brought two systems. I'm a little bit crazy like that. So I brought a Nikon system with a D810 and a D4. And then I also brought a second system, a 7D Mark II, brand new body for me, with a 150 to 600 and it worked killer, really, really well. On a crop body, the 150 600 was an astounding, what, what is it, 240 to 960 at 10 frames a second in a small little light rig. That'd be a really good rig for like a safari or something, just excellent. It worked very well in Japan. Not as well as for low light, like that a 5D would or a D4 would, but for good light, general photography, general wildlife and action, that was a really killer setup. A 7D Mark II with a 150 to 600. Very sharp, very quick, lightning quick. Another case, you know, I'm, I'm probably would be using uh, a manual mode in this. And one of the reasons is, is I'm going, I'm going for silhouette. So I probably would just meter the, meter the sky to the left or the right to have the tree fall into just a shadow, just black. Uh, what'll happen if you use an auto meter in this case, sometimes it'll open up too much. It'll see all the dark tree. It'll open up too much. And then what happens to the background? You lose all the color. Okay. Another tip, one thing you can do is also, what I like to do is, is I like setting a manual white balance. So I can get the color I want in the camera. It's just super simple. 
So what you can do is you can use live view, you can just guess, you go into the manual setting, you go where it says K and then you dial in temperature. So uh, like 3000 would be bright blue, 10,000 is orange. I think this is probably around eight, seven, 8,000. It gives you the golden color that you see. What happens if you use auto white balance, what happens? It tries to pull all the cast out and it gives you like a light gray or like a real, real faint pink. But I like to actually get it the way it looks in the viewfinder. You might say, well, I can just set that later in Lightroom or Photoshop. Well, you have two problems with that. How do you remember what the color was two months later, number one? Number two, um, the way I do it, I get more of an accurate exposure, a lot more accurate exposure. In a lot of cases, you'll have tons of problems with the channel, like blown out the red channel. You'll have lots of problems with the, with the exposure later. I mentioned we get other eagles up there. We get the white-tailed sea eagle, which is a relative. It's a cousin, I think, of the bald eagle. This is the bird you'll see. If anyone here is from Europe, you'll see this bird all through Europe. Africa, Europe, everywhere. All over Europe. Real popular bird. Especially up in Scandinavia, you get lots of these birds. All through Asia. About the same size as the bald eagle. And this is what's called a top shot. So it's a bank top shot. Full spread. Not so easy to get. Not the easiest picture to get ever. And you see that I have great feather detail and I have good whites. That's by exposing to the right. So I'm putting the bird's tone on the tail. I'm putting it right to the right side of the histogram in the last box. It gives you great feather detail. And also, on a case like this, a zoom lens is invaluable because I don't have to worry so much about you know, cutting wings off. If anybody here is a bird photographer, they know what I'm talking about. This is right around two thousandth of a second. Stellar landing. So it's really tough. You know, I'm trying to give you... Um, my favorites, it's really tough in a 40 minute presentation to go in very much depth of anything, but hopefully I inspired you a little bit. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.